the blue of the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that lets success so high. I will achieve. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Banking Show, where we bring you the story behind the latest developments in the banking sector. It is September 14th and I am Ruchika Chitravanshi. This week's cover story asks whether the RBI should allow more NBFCs to accept public deposits. In Banker's View this week, we have LIC Housing Finance CEO, Tribhuvan Adhikari with us. For Banking for You, we explore the UPI ATM. In Expert Take, our consulting editor, Tamal Bandopadhyay, joins us to discuss various issues from internationalizing the rupee to regulating cryptocurrency. At the show's end, we will share the results of the last week's poll and the question for this week. The Reserve Bank of India officials have told NBFCs that they need to get a handle on their increasing reliance on bank borrowings. For their part, NBFC chiefs have requested the RBI to allow them to accept public deposits. However, the RBI's policy has been to discourage NBFCs from engaging in deposit mobilization activities. In fact, the RBI has not allowed any new NBFC to accept public deposits for more than 15 years. But given the RBI's concerns about their reliance on bank borrowings, should the central bank now allow more NBFCs to accept public deposits? The Reserve Bank of India wants non-banking financial companies to control their increasing reliance on bank borrowings. In turn, NBFCs want the RBI to allow them to accept public deposits, which would help them diversify their liabilities. This was the exchange between RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das and Chief Executives of Shadow Banks in an August 25th meeting in Mumbai. The context is necessary here. The RBI has been discouraging NBFCs from mobilizing deposits. The regulator's rationale has been that this protects the interests of depositors and ensures financial stability. As such, the number of deposit-taking NBFCs fell to 49 as of March 2022, from a high of 220 as of March 2015. The RBI has not allowed new NBFCs to accept public deposits for more than 15 years. NBFCs in India are categorized by type of liabilities. There are deposit non-banking financial companies which can accept deposits from the public and non-deposit non-banking financial companies which cannot. So what has led to the recent concerns of the regulator? Well, the number of systemically important non-deposit taking NBFCs has increased in recent years. From 263 as of March 2019, to 422 as of March 2022. Meanwhile, the RBI has indicated that NBFCs need to lower their dependence on bank borrowing, which has almost tripled since 2017. Bank borrowings by NBFCs have surged from 3.13 trillion rupees in March 2017 to 9.24 trillion rupees in September 2022. On the other hand, public deposits form only a small portion of NBFC liabilities. These deposits have increased from 30,600 crore rupees in March 2017 to 71,640 crore rupees in September 2022. The deposits of deposit-taking NBFCs are not insured by the Deposit Insurance and Credit Guarantee Corporation. Hence, the RBI has mandated that only investment-grade deposit-taking NBFCs can accept fixed deposits from the public. Now, back to the original question. An explicit statement of the RBI's policy on this matter came in 2017, when the then Deputy Governor, N.S. Viswanathan, said that while the central bank had granted certain NBFCs licenses to accept public deposits, it would refrain from doing so in the future. What is public funds, basically? Now, when you draw credit from the banking system, it's certainly public funds, because banks in turn get the monies by way of deposits that they mobilize from the system, basically, from the economy. So therefore, it's public funds. 
So is the deposits, basically. <clears throat> now, NBFs is depending too much on public funds is certainly a bad example. It's certainly a no-no as far as my mind is concerned. On the other hand, a recent Business Standard poll showed that 57% of respondents were in favour of the RBI allowing NBFCs to accept deposits, with the remaining 43% being opposed to the idea. Presently, the bigger shadow banks are treated with an equal degree of regulation as banks. But the RBI has not given any indication if it will allow NBFCs to accept public deposits. So, how can NBFCs contain their increasing reliance on bank borrowings? What do the NBFCs do today? Yeah, A, they rely on the, the banking system, of course. But B, they also can issue paper. Now, when they issue paper, automatically a certain sense of governance comes in. The RBI will have no view, I can assure you, if let's say an NBFC were to raise its equity capital and to service it, you know, for instance, and to fund, let's say, the borrowers from out of that. Because at the end of it, if they are lending at a healthy 17, 18% or 19% regime, then they would certainly be able to provide shareholders a good return, you know, basically. NBFCs will have to accept the fact that there is an established method of their working. They must remain within that. The expert business standard spoke to is in agreement with the RBI's policy of discouraging NBFCs from mobilizing deposits. For now, it appears that allowing more NBFCs to accept public deposits is not necessary, even if the RBI wants them to arrest their reliance on bank borrowings. Because shadow banks have other well-established routes to achieve the same goal. The RBI governor recently met NBFC CEOs and asked them to cut their reliance on bank funds. So it looks like public deposits in NBFCs could wait a little longer. In our next segment, the LIC Housing Finance MD and CEO says most of their borrowings are via NCDs and will beef up mobilizing public deposits. Here is the conversation with Manojit Saha. Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Banking Show. LIC yeah. Housing Finance reported a healthy set of numbers in the first quarter with net profit increasing 43% year on year to more than 1300 crore. Its net interest margin also swelled to 3.21% as compared to 2.51% a year ago. Thiruvan Adhikari, who was appointed as the MDC of LIC Housing Finance in June, is with us today to discuss the Q1 numbers and the road ahead. Mr. Adhikari, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Manoji. Thank you for having me. First of all, sir, the, the, the disbursement, loan disbursement, uh, total disbursement uh, fell in Q1 to about 11,000 crore from 15,000 crore in the same period of last year. Both uh, individual home loan segment and project loans uh, declined. What could be the reason for the, for the decline? Uh, this year, two things happened. At LACHFL, we went in for a major restructuring of the organization, number one. Uh, let me uh, expand on that. Uh, we changed our structure from a four-tier structure to a five-tier structure. Earlier, we had the corporate office here in Mumbai. We had our uh, regional offices at nine uh, locations, all your tier one cities. And then we had uh, our uh, back offices and then the area offices or the uh, branch offices, as we call in any industry. This year, we have introduced a new tier in the form of cluster offices. This is between the regional of uh, the back office and the area office. Uh, this was basically done, uh, number one, to with a view to improve our TAT, improve our servicing standards. Number two, we also opened 50 new area offices. All these offices area were offices. 50 new area offices. These are our basic branch offices of what we call. These are the offices who are really in touch with the customers, where customers come for their uh, loan requirements and other things. And these offices were mostly opened in tier two and tier three towns, uh, considering the potential of these areas. So this restruct because of this restructuring, there was a lot of manpower redeployment, if I may. And actually, as you know, if people move from location A to location B, they do take time to settle down and other things. So that was one. And the other was at the same time, we went in for a major technological upgrade. We changed our technological platform altogether from our older system, which was introduced in 2012. We went in for a total new uh, technological uh, software platform uh, that created some issues. So you think that the Q2 numbers uh, will not reflect any dis uh, disruptment that has happened in Q1? 
Q2, yes, we are trying to, of course, Q1, the disruptment that happened that is there. Q2, we are trying to ensure that there is no disruptant on uh, disruptant when we as we move from quarter two. So, sir, overall, if I can ask, what kind of loan disbursement you are expecting for the current financial year uh, on a year and year basis? A year on year basis, uh, our guidance was 12 to 15 percent. We still maintain the guidance. Yes, there is a lot of talk of uh, maybe a huge uptake in loans in the coming period. Uh, but I would uh, not be too, of course, I agree the uh, everything is great. Everything looks great outside, except maybe for the geopolitical situation outside, wherein uh, US and Europe are facing recession returns and of course the Ukraine conflict and other things. So again, uh, I have a very positive up outlook and uh, I would still maintain that 12 to 15 percent year on year uh, growth in our books. The other issue I wanted to discuss is the, is the, is the, asset quality the stage 3 npa numbers are at an elevated level what are the measures you are planning to take to reduce those numbers lic housing finance is not known for doing a large number of um, uh, one time settlement or a sale to arcs so how do you tackle that yeah true true manaji it's uh, very very true as on 30th june our uh, gross npas were at 4.98% of course this was just a marginal 0.02% increase from that of 31st march uh, as I said, uh, we had a new technological platform introduced in the month of March. Uh, yeah, some of the uh, problems were because of that. We had some issues as regards presentment and uh, adjustments and all that. But now that is more or less taken uh, care of. Uh, we are well provisioned. We have a provision of almost 42% uh, against the mandated 40% as on 30th of June. And uh, so, yes, we are very much concerned with that. Uh, not at all acceptable. 4.98% uh, is not at all acceptable. Would ideal, ideally like to be around about uh, 3.7 or maximum 3, uh, two, uh, no, sorry, 2.75 or 3% would be what we are targeting. As regards what we, what we are intending to do, yes, you are also right that we have so far not been very aggressive on the OTS, the one-time settlement uh, strategy, and in fact, ARCs, we have not explored at all till now. Uh, very recently, I think four or five months back, we have come out with an ARC policy, which has been approved by the board. Uh, just this month, in the beginning of this month, uh, we had a meeting with uh, some ARCs. Yes, definitely, we are exploring both the OTS. Now we are quite, uh, we are uh, pretty much focused on the OTS route. Uh, we have also come out with a special uh, recovery campaign for our uh, borrowers, especially the NPA, NPA uh, people, where uh, we are uh, sort of willing to negotiate on the, uh, the interest, the additional interest part, and uh, sort of coerce the, not coerce me, sort of convince the borrower that, okay, come back, make it, uh, pay, pay back all your dues, or if uh, you want, you can close the loan account. So we are these right. these, right. these are the two three strategies we are following, and I'm sure uh, in the coming maybe not immediately this quarter, but definitely by Q3 uh, we should be uh, nearer to three percent, nearer to three percent from 4.98 percent. Uh, the good thing about Q1 was the margins went up very substantially uh, to more than three percent uh, net interest margins. But do you think this kind of margins you can sustain? Uh, honestly, blunt answer would be no. <laughs> Yes, uh, see well, what has happened in Q1 uh, last year. Uh, this two uh, 200 basis points rate high, rate high, uh, was passed on to the consumers, and uh, I think the full effect of that uh, came into Q1. Uh, the full I effect see. was that experienced by us in Q1, and that is why this slightly, I would say, abnormal uh, NIM or net interest margin of 3.1 percent. I think uh, the more uh, sort of say the targetable uh, net interest margin would be between uh, 2.5 to 2.75. That Correct. is that is what we are targeting. That would be reasonable and that would be sustainable also. Uh, sustainable. So that is what we are targeting, and I believe uh, we should be within that range. Thank you so much for speaking to Business Standard. It was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, same here, Manan. That was a great pleasure talking to you. Another digital initiative that can further accentuate India's efforts to digitally empower its citizen has taken shape at the Global Fintech Fest earlier this month in Mumbai. Hitachi Payment Services launched what is being hailed as a significant milestone in banking services, the UPI ATM. These ATMs will enable hassle-free access to cash without using any physical cards even in the country's remote areas.
कस्तूरी अखिल फाइंड आउट आओ वेल दिस मे बी अ ग्लिम्स इन टू द फ्यूचर ऑफ ए टी एम्स यूनियन मिनिस्टर पीयूष गोयल रिसेंटली शेयर अ वीडियो ऑन एक्स शोइंग हाउ द न्यूली लॉन्च यू पी आई ए टी एम वर्क इट वॉज लॉन्च एट ग्लोबल फिनटेक फेस्ट ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री हेल्ड इन मुंबई ऑन फिफ्थ सेप्टेम्बर डेवलप्ड बाई हिटाची पेमेंट सर्विसेज अ सब्सिडरी ऑफ जपान बेस्ड हिटाची दिस ए टी एम विल अलाउ पीपल टू विदड्रॉ कैश from their bank accounts through their unified payments interface or UPI applications before this a host of banks like SBI ICICI bank Axis bank and bank of baroda allowed their customers to withdraw money by using UPI feature but these ATMs were primarily meant for card users in april this year RBI governor Shaktikanta Das had announced that the central bank has proposed to make cardless cash withdrawal facility available at all ATMs across the country using UPI the work on this project is still on meanwhile the new UPI ATM is turning heads it is a white label ATM which is owned set up and operated by non banking entities the reserve bank of india has allowed non bank entities to set up white label ATMs to improve accessibility to ATMs especially in semi urban and rural areas sumil vikram se managing director and ceo of hitachi payment services said that not just banks but payment service providers who have done the certification and are enabled for interoperable cardless cash withdrawal functionality can also use hitachi's upi atm to provide the service to withdraw money customers will have to scan the qr code on any UPI app on their mobile phone to complete the transaction the QR code will be generated on the ATM screen after the customer selects the UPI cash withdrawal option at the ATM and enters the desired withdrawal amount once the customer scans the unique and secure dynamic QR code using the UPI app they will have to enter their UPI pin to authorize the transaction and the desired amount will then get dispensed the upi atm enables a withdrawal limit of 10000 rupees per transaction this will be a part of the existing daily upi transaction limits set by the issuer banks upi atms are currently available in mumbai but its deployment is set to expand across the country in the coming months i am the blue of the limitless sky I am the inspiration that lets success so high I will achieve I will fly high I am the I in SBI I'm back by the nation's trusted bank SBI I the bank of to every Indian A hassle free access to cash is something a lot of us would be looking forward to Our next segment is about internationalizing the rupee, cryptocurrency and more as I spoke to our consulting editor Tamal Bandopadhyay on what's been making news in the financial world. Here's the chat. Hi Tamal, welcome to the Business Standard Banking show. Uh so first of all, as you said uh, in your column this week, you talked about internationalization of rupee and as you said it is the hottest conversation uh, topic on every bank's uh, treasury floor i want to ask you a broad question on what do you think is the future of internationalization of rupee internationalization in that sense it's it's far far away but does that mean nothing is happening no lots of things are this first one small uh, technical part what is a currency which which uh, replaces the earlier barter system now currency it's a sort of unit of account you know that that has an exchange value uh, it is a medium of exchange and finally it has a store value which means it's an asset now why uh, dollar is the most sort of the currency because of its uh, it's an asset and you know uh, despite everything just people you know us economy debt to gdp ratio etc but still dollar is the king 
So what India is doing, India is doing is uh, getting into bilateral arrangement with many, many countries for our export and import, you do in our local currency. Invoicing and exchange, everything will be in local currency. But the moment we find that more and more countries are doing business export import with India in our local currency, uh, for exchange risk we are not bearing and the importance of having huge pile of foreign exchange reserve also will not be that much important. Okay. So, so to the very short answer to your question is this internationalization is long way. I don't know it in decades away, uh, but uh, we are taking the right steps, which have lots and lots of advantages. We are on the right track. We are on the right track. Now, since we are talking about rupee, I think I want to talk to you about crypto uh, first before we move on to our next question. So this week we had uh, the G20 New Delhi Leaders Declaration, which had uh, as part of it uh, the synthesis paper by IMF and FSB, which has laid down the risks that crypto uh, poses for macroeconomic and global financial stability. But interestingly, it has said that ban is not an easy option. So what do you think is going to be the future of crypto? Because a ban seems to be sort of uh, off the table and we are looking at regulation. Uh, just want to get your view on this whole uh, crypto situation that India now finds itself in and not just India, the world. Reserve Bank of India governor that made it extremely clear that no, I mean, it's it's not done. Crypto was not done. So the crypto craze, which was during the COVID time we had, but the last one year, it's been waned too much. And in fact, uh, uh, last Business Standard BFSI conference in December, uh, Reserve Bank of India governor, even before that also, I remember there were two subsequent um, BFSI business standard conferences where governor, and for the first time in 2021, he said, no, nothing on crypto. And he repeated that in 2022. So it was very negative as far as the crypto uh, companies were concerned, currency users were concerned about. But now it is a, it, now we, I think we need to see it in a new light. Uh, and it looks like that as, as the IMF paper, if you see that, there has to be a collective effort. There will be collective uh, um, consensus approach by the entire, uh, I mean, all the nations of the part of G20. What needs to be done? What are the caveats? Because what I may fear say that banning is a tough task. So instead of going for banning, we have to figure out what are the rules and regulations put in place uh, that that the that you know take away the. Uh, the all the all the I would say dangers associated with because at the end of the day crypto is not an asset it's neither a currency not an asset it's uh I mean I'm afraid to say that it's it's nothing but a gambling so how do you how do you manage it uh, I think it it becomes now um, we we need to wait and watch I don't have any solution but entire thing has got a new dimension and I think the crypto guys will must be cheering up now this this move. But uh, as you rightly said, regulating crypto is not going to be an easy task. Absolutely. Um, coming to the last question uh, for this episode, uh, Tamal, what do you think of this whole incremental cash reserve ratio and its impact on liquidity of banks? As we speak, the systemic liquidity, I'm not talking about the government cash balance with RBI. It's about 90,000 crore. But uh, as we approach the uh, festive season, as you as you know, the currency with public goes up. You and me, we start withdrawing money for shopping and other things and all. And now, also, of course, the elections also, you know, we round the corner. And historically, during the election time, again, uh, currency with public goes up. And finally, with rupee weakening against dollar, Reserve Bank of India also has been buying, selling dollar. And for every dollar it sells, it sucks out rupee. So we need to wait and watch how the liquidity goes up. 
as you speak, as you said, 90,000 is, is the systemic liquidity. That's including the 25% that has come up from this 10% ICRR in given to CRR. Another, say, 60,000 odd, um, or, or rather 75, 80,000 odd money would come. But at the same time, during festive season, uh, currency with public will go up, which will soak the systemic liquidity. And during election time also, um, as I said, the, the currency with public goes up. So it is a little bit of, and then the then the do, dollar appreciation is also there. Even though the dollar index, if you see the dollar index, uh, um, the way rupee has been behaving when dollar index was 114.8 uh, rupee uh, was uh, um, uh, rupee uh, went down. But uh, as we speak, dollar index is close to 105. But rupee still, you know, has not done that well. Uh, has not strengthen to that extent uh, so we will we may see rbi continuously um, um, selling dollar uh, to to uh, to protect i'm sorry i'm yes uh, to selling dollar to protect the rupee uh, so all these things will complicate it will not be very easy we cannot predict the liquidity scenario and what reserve bank of india has done uh, this uh, in phases, I think that's the right thing to do. But we need to keep a very close watch as we approach the festive season and the elections. So RBI is on the right track, uh, not just on internationalization of rupee, as you said, but also uh, the ICRR. Of course, this is a situation we have to wait and watch, as we have to do for crypto as well, which is not going to be an easy one. Thank you so much, uh, Tamal, for joining us today and sharing your insights. See you next week. Thank you. Lots to watch out for, as Tamal has pointed out. It is time now for our poll results. Here's what we asked you last week. Should RBI allow NBFCs to accept deposits? 57% of our respondents said yes, it should, while 43% said it should not allow NBFCs to accept deposits. With the UPI ATM having been unveiled this week, we would like you to answer this question for us. Would you like to withdraw money from the UPI ATM? Our poll is open from today, that is Thursday, and you can respond on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Telegram, and our website. We will be back next week with more news and analysis. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn. I am the blue of the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that lets success so high. I will achieve. Trusted Bank, SBI, SBI the banker SBI. to every Indian.